Welcome to the Greg Bennett Show presented by Any Question. I am your host, Greg Bennett. And this episode was first recorded last year with arguably the greatest triathlete to ever do the sport, Nicholas Spierig. And the reason I'm sharing this episode again is Nicholas Spierig, after almost 30 years in the sport, has done her final race this past weekend, September 9th. And I wanted to make sure that my show, my listeners, we celebrate Nicholas Spierig. She truly has been at the pointy end of the sport for her entire career, from when she was a junior all the way through to Olympic gold, Olympic gold in London when she outsprinted Lisa Norton, one of the most remarkable sprint finishers we've ever seen in this in the sport. She then backed that up with a silver medal in Rio only four years later, and that was after having her first child. She's since had she's had three children. She did a law degree during her career as well. And honestly, even this past year. In her final year, she still went and broke eight hours for the Ironman in the sub seven, sub eight. She went and won her race at the Collins Cup for Team Europe, which ended up dominating. And so she's leaving on a high. She's leaving still winning. And honestly, not only is she one of the greatest athletes to ever do the sport, she's been a long, long time friend of both Laura and mine. But I just wanted to make sure that we take this time to celebrate Nicola Spierig. I wanted to personally thank her for all the entertainment and inspiration from her career. Just truly one of the all-time greats. Nicola, all the very, very best for your your future endeavours. I will bring you back on this show uh, so we can sort of go through it all again, but I did already have this one. I didn't want to have to redo it for your sake, but here it is, uh, the episode with Nicola Spierig, which was done last November. A little bit of housekeeping before we go on. I want to thank you all so much for listening and sharing and, of course, your feedback. I do take all of it on board and I do truly appreciate it. And a reminder to go check out any question. Uh, my business partner, Ed Baker, and I are building a platform, a Q&A platform, where we want to make sure that we allow access to all the greatest minds and thought leaders in the world, to everybody in the world. Um, so go on there, ask the almost 500 plus experts we have now a question you can listen to all of their answers it's free for the first hour so go check it out any question and i'd love your support and feedback on what we're doing at any question as well so please you know reach out to me and let me know what you think but enjoy this one nicholas spirig thank you again and remember success comes to those who endure just one moment longer All right, today I'm joined by the greatest female Olympian in the sport of triathlon. Most athletes are lucky to get five years on top of the sport in in their chosen sports. My guest today has been on top for 20 years, five Olympics, one gold, one silver, two sixth, and a 19th. Unbelievable. 116 ITU starts with 26 wins. Add to that six European titles a junior world title, Ironman, and numerous half Ironman distance victories, and a stellar running career that has seen her run a 237 marathon at the European Athletic Championships. Oh, and along the way, she married Rito Hook, a remarkable professional athlete on his own right, and had three children. And if that's not enough, she completed a law degree. Unbelievable. I'm exhausted. Anyway, She's been a great friend to Laura and I for over two decades, and it's just a tremendous honor and privilege to have her on the show today. So welcome, and thanks for joining us on The Greg Bennett Show, Nicola Spierig. How are you? Hi, Greg. Hi, Laura. It's an honor to be here, and thank you very much for this long introduction. (laughs) I'm exhausted from that introduction, and I cut (laughs) it down. You've been busy. (laughs) And yes, as you said, Laura has joined us today. My goodness, Laura, it's taken me a while to get you back on the show as well, so welcome. Thank you. I didn't want to miss this one with you, Nicola. (laughs) What a fair date. So excited to speak with you here. Well, you know, this took us Thanks. almost, what, two years of trying to coordinate times and to finally get you on the show? Yeah, I, well, as you said, I've been busy, you've been busy, so. <laughs> I know. Well, you've also got, I, I missed, I took out in that introduction, you've got your your foundation and the kids' races and everything else that you're doing as well. Yes. I, yeah, exactly. I am so baffled how you're doing Taking that. some time as well, but it's, it's very nice. Mm. And congrats on your recent win, Challenge Mallorca. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Yes, we were were here with the family, um, school holidays, training camp and racing combined. So (laughs) busy again. 
<laughs> <laughs> and where are you now? Are you back home or are you, are you in Mallorca still? Um, the family just traveled home and I, I still have uh, three or four days here before I join them again back home. Oh, nice. Leisurely time now. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Just training and working working uh, up all the stuff that piled up on my computer and doing podcasts with you. And uh, But <laughs> yes, no, oh, well, no, no kids noise in the background. So that's I good. I know. It must feel so good. Um, <laughs> for everybody, we met and I was trying to think, was it back at the Lausanne World Championships in 98? Did we meet there? Probably. I was there and you were there. So uh, yeah. we probably met there, yes. Probably also yeah. through Rito and the other Swiss guys. I don't know. Yeah, ab- yeah. Absolutely. I know. It's amazing. It's a long time ago. Well, look, today I want to sort of, you know, get to know you a little bit better, look back at your, your past and your, and your career, um, your recent events. I also want to dissect just how you're able to manage everything that you've got on the table. It's just absolutely extraordinary to me how you can manage the family and the foundations and the, you know, basically being one of the greatest at every time you turn up to a race, you affect it. And what was impressive a couple of weeks ago when we we did the show together with all the Olympic champions from 2008 and each and every one of them, Emma Snowsill, now Fredino, Gwen Jorgensen, Flora Duffy, they all mentioned you as being a player in their race. At each of the Olympics, you haven't just been a tourist at the Olympics. You've gone there and you've either won, medaled, or had a a massive impact on the race itself. So I kind of want to just look at all of that as well. So there's a lot to cover. Um, I know we've started with some general chit-chat. What I'd like to do is just start by recapping this year, um, just because it's fresh, um, and then we'll look at rewinding the clock and, and looking at your career from the start. But This year, um, a lot of half Ironman racing, half distance, plus an Olympics thrown in in the middle. What, I mean, what was the focus or were you using those sort of half races as training for the Olympics or how does that work for you? Yes, the... The highlight of the of the year or the the big goal was clearly the Olympics for me, but um, with Brett Sutton as a coach, we we have also always used half distance races to to get fit uh, in the preparation. For example, in 2012, before the Olympics in London, I think I did a half Ironman 13 days before the Olympics. So everyone thought I was completely crazy, (laughs) but it it worked out. (laughs) I still won. (laughs) So um, it works for me. I, I, I like those races as preparation races. And after the Olympics now, it was also, um, just, just keeping fit and, and getting some more, um, experience over the longer distances because the next goal next year will be over a long distance race. So it was, it was fun to have some more races and, um, just get some more experience. Mm. What, what is that? Tell us a little bit about that big goal next year. <laughs> the next big goal is the sub eight project. Oh, yes, yes. Um, it's two women try to do an Ironman or an Ironman distance under eight hours and two men try to do the Ironman distance under seven hours, kind of like the the marathon project uh, where they mm-hmm. try to go uh, under two hours. So it's going to be very interesting. Of course, it's a, we're trying to choose a fast course and we are allowed to have some pacemakers. So it won't be a normal Ironman, but it will still be very, very difficult to, to get mm-hmm. close to those eight hours or under. So what, it, what sort of times have you got to do if you break down the, the Ironman? Have you got a, a math in your mind of what you'd like to be doing there? Um, we still have to discuss a lot and there are different tactics, of course. And I think that's uh, one of the interesting things about this project. Like, for example, um, Christian Blumenfeld, I think he was, I'm not sure if I heard it in one of your podcasts or an interview he gave where he said he doesn't even want to ride much faster, but he wants to run uh, the marathon much faster than uh, in, in normally in, in Ironman. Mm-hmm. Um, like a 220 or close to that. So it wow. depends what tactics you have and, and also, of course, what pacemakers you have and how, how you use them. Um, there's still a lot to discuss. But I think you can – he's kind of right that you have – of course, you have to do 
all the three disciplines really fast. Like um, <laughs> I'm still having to get over the, the fast times in all the disciplines. I think you have to ride about a 42K average over the 180K and still run like a 245 marathon or something to, to make the time. But um, yeah, we, we are trying to figure it out. And um, I, I rely on some help of the pacemakers as well. And do you get to pick your pacemakers? Like who, do you get to have guy, like some guys or yes. is it all women or – we are still discussing, but I think yeah. the, the organizers want us to have women as pacemakers. And that, mm. of course, makes it quite difficult to find, especially like athletes who can ride that fast over 180K. Mm. You are allowed to kind of have riders for like only 40K and then change. But I think in total, we're only allowed to have eight pacemakers over all the disciplines. So, yeah, it will be tricky to find fast enough riders, female riders, to, to actually go those 42K per hour over 180K. Yeah, it's, it's wow. actually going to be quite a process just managing all the people and exactly. figuring out how to expend the energy exactly. the right way. Yes, and, mm. and you know, the good, the good athletes, of course, have their own races and their own race season. And, mm. Um, mm. yes, it's going to be tricky. But, you know, it, that's also... I guess that's also the challenge about it to to handle everything and to manage everything and to to find the right people and um, yeah we are onto it now. Laura, are you ready to make a comeback? Yeah, need a pacemaker. Yes. Laura yes, hasn't uh, swum over a kilometer in six years. <laughs> oh, she still ha- we still have time. It's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's the date? What's the cut off date? <laughs> <laughs> what, what actually what actually interests me when i first heard about this project i was like oh no way i'm gonna be 40 and it's after the olympics and i will be um tired and but it's also like the things around like the project is um organized by phoenix and phoenix also has a foundation with basically exactly the same gold and my foundation they want to get as many kids as possible active to teach them how sports can influence their life uh, how sport is good for them and the sub eight project is actually to to find money for the foundation and to inspire all as or as many people as possible to follow their dreams and mm-hmm. even if a goal sounds as impossible as that sub sub eight project um, to inspire them to to try it and to go for it, and I think that what's um, what I like about it to just try and inspire other people and try to um, earn uh, as much money as possible for the foundation and for the kids. So for me, this thought behind it is is very important as well. That's fantastic. It, it gives you a great platform. And it was one thing when I walked away from the conversation with, with you and, and, and the other ladies in the, uh, the Olympic Champions episode that we did, I really were left going, wow, what an impressive group of women that and you even said in the show, I just wanted to win a race. And all of a sudden I had yeah. all this responsibility to become like this person that's going to have foundations and kids races and, and use the Olympic gold for more than just putting it around your neck. It's actually, it's a useful to be able to reach people and inspire people. And, um, I left that conversation going, wow, you know, and, and you really stood out in that because you, you have gone about since you're 2012, because you are a bit of an introvert and, and then having to go, hang on, I've got a, I've got this gold medal. Now I've got to be this like, ta-da, look at me, jazz hands. And, and I, think, uh, I think that's what you've taken on really well. And to hear you just speak like you just did about, you know, the Phoenix Foundation aligning with your foundation and this platform and the fact that you're going to try and break sub eight hours for an Ironman also, children can follow their dreams. You hear that, kids? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not just kids. No, so that, that's just also. Oh, not yeah. just kids. Everybody. Oh, yes. Okay, Every, everybody, of no, course. Everybody, of course. also you. No, no. yes, it's, yeah. as you say, like it wasn't my, my goal or my intention when I started sports or started to become a professional, of course, to, um, to have a foundation and to, to inspire. It was my goal just to follow my dream and, um, in races but 
it, and it took me quite a while to realize that I can inspire people. And as you say, I'm not the kind of person who uh, loves to be uh, in, in, in the public and, and loves to speak and loves to, to be an idol. But it's actually, it also gives me a lot to see those kids and see other people being inspired. It, it's amazing to see. And um, we... We do have those kids' faces. We do have the foundation. And now through Phoenix, we have the possibility to connect it internationally, like worldwide. We try to, or we are connecting the kids' faces with uh, kids' series in, in Australia, in Poland, now with Javier Gomez in, in Spain, with uh, Alison Brown, it will be a kids' series in England. So it, it's amazing now to see how it spreads like internationally. And also the, the school programs, um, they started in Poland and now we are, um, implementing it in, in Switzerland and, uh, we are talking to other, to other countries like Greece. And that, that's really, really nice to see what an impact it can have and that I can play, play my role in it. And, and yes, uh, be, be a bit of an inspiration for, for those people and those kids. Well, it's absolutely amazing. Good on you. Mm-hmm. I, um, and the sport's all better for you and, and the world is better for you in the terms of inspiring young young people for primarily and all of us to some degree to follow our dreams and stuff. So absolutely fantastic. Before we go on to rewinding the clock, I do want to just have a quick look at um, the Olympics, Tokyo. Um, there was a photo of you that you put out running around the track before the Olympics and boy, did you look ready. And I know you're not allowed to say anymore somebody looks fit because I don't, I don't want to upset people, but you had a look about you that looked like you were ready to race the Olympic Games. Let me put it that way. There was a pack of six yeah. or something. There was a six pack <laughs> located. Um, and you did look um, like you were ready. Sixth at the Olympics, thoughts, solid event, takeaways. What do you think? As you said, I thought the same. I was, I was very happy to... Um, get to the Olympics and looking back to at the preparation and being really happy with the preparation like that that was my main goal to have a preparation um, without injuries uh, where I could really train again uh, as I wanted um, I had good really good races before the Olympics um, I won the European championships uh, over the half distance before really good people like Anne Haug. I, I did my personal best um, times in uh, 10K run races, several 10K run races. What was so that? I'm going to butt in. What was that? What was uh, your personal? Well, I just, it wasn't that fast, but I, I just came from a training camp. I don't know. It was like 33, 20 or something close to that. I, I'm not sure. But it was clearly personal best, so I was happy. Laura, would and you take I would definitely take that. (laughs) (laughs) Can I have that? (laughs) You know, after three kids, it's good. It's not too bad. That's what we're saying. Sure. And um, that was, I was really happy. I, I, that was my main goal to get to the Olympics to say I had a great preparation and I am in the mix. So I, I have the chance to win the medal. And I think that was the case. At the race, at the day itself, it was uh, raining. It was very funny because everyone prepared for uh, a hot day, hot and humid day, and it was raining. And I didn't mind. I think it was just important to to adapt to the situation. Um, I think I did that well. I just um, swam a bit too slow. But the the first six had uh, a bit more as, as one minute uh, gap after the swim and I think the swim wasn't too bad because it was just the first six swimming really fast and then all the other fast people who swim normally fast were not more than 20 seconds in front of me so that's that's actually a good swim for me but the first six were just a little bit too fast and then on the on the bike course I tried my best but I didn't have much help in my pack Mm. so to to ride against the six in the front um was a was a a big a huge challenge and i think also i i was happy with my performance i was just um the the first six did really well on the bike they were working uh, together really well so um i couldn't really i could close the gap a little bit but not enough and um on the run 
again, I that's why I was actually happy when I was uh, running to the finish line because I thought I I really did my best in that race. I got sixth. I didn't get the medal I was basically aiming for, but that sports I was. Uh, I did get a medal the last two Olympics, so I, I can't complain. And I can look back and say, um, I, I wouldn't change anything. I, I don't see anything that I could have done better. So, so I'm happy with the performance. And I think I can also say there are three athletes on the podium who really earned it, who showed a, a really great race. So that's all, always also good, I think, to, to look up at the podium and say, well, those are athletes uh, that deserved it and that showed a, a great performance. Well said. I think uh, I couldn't agree more. And it was nice to, even when Flora spoke and, and she said, yeah, I had a nice group up front. And the only person I was worried about, <laughs> the only person I was worried about was Nicola. And then I saw she was kind of on her own driving that pack. And I thought, uh, okay. We're good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was good to hear that she was worried about me. That, yes. that shows that. <laughs> yes, I know. Well I, well, I do want to step through each of your Olympics a little bit later, but right now I just want to move um, on so we can all get to know you a little bit more and maybe just wind the clock back and tell us about, you know, when your passion for triathlon and endurance sports sort of began. How old were you and, and where were you and what did that look like? Um, I was I was growing up in a family. I had a sister and a brother, and I had parents uh, who were sports teachers. So I I was lucky to be able to try out a lot of different sports. I was playing basketball for a long time in winter. We were skiing and snowboarding. Um, I was swimming early in a swim club and doing doing lots of sports also in some local clubs in the village. So I think from early on. Um, I found that passion of just for sports in general. I really love to move and to to be active. And I also played basketball until until high school, like quite a long time and loved running. I did some run races, got second uh, twice in the junior cross country European championships. <laughs> so, um the Athletics um, Federation was quite interested in me as well. But like at the stage of age of 17, uh, around that, I, I had to kind of choose sports because it was just too much, too many races, too many uh, trainings. that I couldn't fit it all in. And I just thought that I, I couldn't ima imagine to just run day in, day out. I just, as a 17 year old, I was like, oh my God, that must be boring to just always mm -hmm. run. So with triathlon, at least I could still do three sports in one or three disciplines in one sports. It was around that time also that triathlon became an Olympic sports in 2000 in Sydney. Mm. And I knew the athletes going there. Like I knew the Swiss women going to Sydney. I I also had already beaten the, the third woman a few times. So the Olympic dream also um, like developed there. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe I could go the, to the Olympics or the next Olympics. So to me, that was, I would say that was the stage when I, chose triathlon and started to train more seriously and um, also around that time I became first time junior European champion in triathlon um, 98 you mentioned mm -hmm. I became fifth at the f of my first junior worlds in Lausanne so I started to have some good results and, and you were only 16 more there you yes 16? exactly yeah yeah so yeah. I had a few more years in the junior category yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were there. I just know. entered it actually <laughs> yeah i got <laughs> fifth in lausanne then i got second in montreal um third i i think in perth and then i finally won the last time in uh in edmonton gee so. what a slow <laughs> learner huh yeah <laughs> <laughs> took me four years <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to win the win with junior yes World well, well done i i, I thought wow. you actually it's funny looking at that resume it's like uh i i just remember you being on the scene in that late 90s early noughties there and it was kind of like yeah you're a junior that kind of almost baffles my mind <laughs> some some of you we were talking to Helen Laura and I were talking to Helen Jenkins and Mark yeah. Jenkins yesterday and um, 
I feel like you and Helen never aged. No. It was like this because I knew you from when you were 16 and so you were always just, I don't you know. think you're just the same age? <laughs> yeah, because you thought you were always just the same age. So oh, yeah. <laughs> all stayed the same. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, and the other thing, have you ever played one-on-one basketball against Marinda Carfrey? No, I never have done that. Oh. <laughs> she's a big... this, I think we're going to set up a little duel here. Yeah. <laughs> really? She, she, uh, she played she's basketball play, as well? She's running she around saying she's the greatest basketball player and that she could <laughs> easily take you down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, yeah, she yeah, is the best runners in the sport. Two of the best runners in the basketball. sport have basketball. That's yeah, it's point. funny because we're we are both not that tall, so uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> both like more more the playmakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. talent so, and agility. Of yes, exactly. <laughs> but so you you basically you found triathlon. Was there any moment? Was it those junior worlds and things that made you think? I mean, you kind of mentioned you'd watched your Swiss counterparts at the 2000 Olympics and you're like, oh, I could probably make that team. But there was, was there one moment, was there one race or was it over time that you were like, this could be a career or this could be something that I do? What was it like for you in that respect? Well, I mentioned my parents were sports teachers, but they were more teachers. Like education was always really important. Um, and I never, for a long time, I never really thought of triathlon as a, as a, job like as a as work it mm. was just my passion and i i did normal school i did normal high school and then i did normal studies um besides doing triathlon so i never i never felt i had to choose or I had to become a professional i just got better and better i had better results and of course then qualifying for athens for my first olympics in 2004 i definitely thought well being an Olympian is not too bad, but yes, for me, it was never like there was never that one race or one point where I thought, well, now I'm a professional or now I, uh, I, I made it. Do you look at yourself now as a professional <laughs> athlete? <I> mean, <laughs> not not anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we, we are, well, Brett is always joking that I'm the world's fastest age group. We, because I, I always had something like besides sports. There mm. were only, basically there were only two years in my career where I, I would say I was a professional and that was uh, 2010. I finished my studies, my law studies. And finally I was like, yes, well, now I'm a professional. Now I'm preparing the Olympics in London, like two years completely as a professional athlete. And um, afterwards, I had uh, I had a family. I, I became pregnant with my our first baby. So then, yes, now I would not say I'm a professional anymore because I'm, uh, as you said, I'm I'm a mom. I'm, I have a foundation. I have a, ki- a triathlon series, kids triathlon series. So my life is pretty full, and I know how a professional triathlon life looks like normally. So now I wouldn't say that's a normal professional life. <laughs> Well, you maximized your two two years as a professional. Exactly. With a <laughs> I, really, I really enjoyed those two years. So, <laughs> And I think you're probably the best age grouper in the sport of triathlon. Yeah. When I, when I look at the 20 years, I, I'd put you probably ranked number one Let's put that in all in the, the age groupers. Yeah. <laughs> Next time I'm going to rewrite that introduction, redo it, and just thank say, you. I am sitting with the world's number one age group triathlon. Yes, that's what Brett always says. So thank you. It's nothing new to me. <laughs> We've talked to you a lot about your success, but have you had moments where you felt like giving it away and quitting? I know you've had a few crashes and broken your hand and done all sorts of things. Have you ever, what have been some of the down times that you've had to deal with and come back? Um, yeah, I did have a few injuries um, and especially with the first ones, I definitely struggled. I was always really frustrated because well, I think all athletes know that time where you're so frustrated because you can't work on your goals as you want to, you can't move forward, you have this annoying injury and have to do stuff to, to heal and to get better, but it doesn't really bring you closer to your goal. Um, I think I learned to deal better with those times and to concentrate on what I can do, not what I can't do, and concentrate on stuff I can probably even improve in those uh, times of injuries. I always loved the sport, and I never really had the thought of giving it up except after London, where we 
clearly planned to have a family and I, I didn't know how my body would react, how mm. I would react mentally, if I would even want to race anymore, if he could organize it um, with a family. So after London, I was quite prepared to give it all up just because I didn't know how it would work out with a family. And the same was after Rio four years later when we had our second child. I, I left it completely open if I would continue or not because I just wanted to to see how it works out and if it would still be the best for the family to to continue. How many crashes have you had? Have you had a few bike crashes? And what happened with that your broken hand and, and how did you get yourself going there? I was actually pretty lucky with crashes. Um, I had probably three crashes in races. But, um, and funny enough, the first one, I think it was the first one, was in 2001 at my last junior world championships, what we were just talking about uh, before. I was so angry with myself that I did crash, that I, I won the race afterwards and became junior world champion. <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't uh, really injured. I was just angry. Then I had the crash, yes, 216, um, probably was the, uh, the worst or the one of the two worst crashes I had where I broke my hand and the problem was it was just a short time before the Olympics in Rio so it was in Abu Dhabi the first international race I called a specialist um, in Switzerland and sent him the the pictures from Abu Dhabi from the hospital and he said well yes broken hand six weeks of complete rest and I told him, well, that's not an option. Go back and have a think about it. And he was pretty stunned because, of course, he was a specialist. And uh, <laughs> lucky enough, he was um, <laughs> he was coming back and said, okay, uh, there's another option. We can have an operation and put in three plates and 23 screws, and then it's pretty fixed, and you can start earlier. And I said, okay, I'm coming back to Switzerland, and um, you do that the next day. <laughs> so. He turned up on Sunday <laughs> with a PowerPoint presentation of three different options. He was really well prepared. So I must have been pretty um, firm with him to, <laughs> to have this <laughs> effect on him, but I was really happy. And, and during the operation, I actually sent Rito on the other side of the, you only, I only have my, my arm paralyzed. I could hear and hear everything. But they have this, um, how do you say, in this curtain, right? So you can't see what they actually mm -hmm. operate on your hand. So I told Rito he should go to the other side and have a look what they do. <laughs> I just could hear how nervous they were and how they forgot the tool in the car up, and know. stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I could just see Rito going. I put a lot so of pressure on them. But... <laughs> oh, my God. oh my God, the poor bugger. <laughs> but, um, no, no. Oh. <laughs> well, obviously, they did a great job. And um, I was on the, on the turbo again, I think, one or two days later. And it was it was a weird situation because we said, okay, the goal is still to to have a medal chance at the Olympics, and I still want to be among the best in a, in a basically I was I don't know it was two or three months out of the out of the, uh, the Olympics, and and I tried to train like preparing the Olympics, but at the same time I couldn't lace my shoes myself, I couldn't do my hair up myself, so. <laughs> I was completely helpless with one hand. <laughs> so R Rita learned a lot of new things like doing a ponytail and everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it was a very interesting time. And um, I'm quite proud because we went to the, to Rio, to the Olympics and I had, I had to change the whole plan. Like Brett and I had to cancel all the international races uh, I hadn't seen the other girls in a race um, since some of them, like when I, I didn't race for four years. So I had no idea where I stood and was pretty nervous. And I think, yes, I, I did extremely well at, uh, under those circumstances. That was a great race. Let's step through each of the Olympics now because I, I think it's uh, it's quite a journey in itself. Oh, four, you qualify. Firstly, that feeling of qualifying for your first Olympics. 
Um, yes, it was it was exhausting because we had to go. Uh, it was about. That is not the reply I was hoping to hear. You were qualified for <laughs> the first Olympics. A deep breath and just saying it's exhausting. <laughs> I can just remember it now. Seriously, the qualification. Be- oh, that's. Yes. I, I I understand how like it's so hard for those athletes like being just like just at that line where you maybe you make it maybe not and you have to earn those points at all those races and um, mm. I think I had within five weeks I had to do four races in four different continents just to make just to beat the third Swiss girl and to to have enough points and everything so that was pretty stressful. But yes, of course, I was extremely happy to to having qualified for the Olympics, and that that was basically the goal, like just to go there and um to enjoy the Olympics and to have the experience. And it was it was amazing. Rita was there as well, so we could enjoy the Olympics, um, both of us together. I was I was a bit injured after that <laughs> exhausting qualification, so I didn't expect much of the Olympics itself. I was just enjoying it. And actually, funny enough, even back then, uh, the Olympic champion day, Kate Allen came up to me and um, thanked me for the, my work on the bike I had done. So already there, I played a little role for the for the Olympic yeah. champion. <laughs> of course. There you go. And this is what and I love about this, this story because your impact across the board is, is really great. And then we move on to 08, Emma Fredino, Emma Snowsill, you know, on our discussion a couple of weeks ago said that she was just keeping an eye on the two Swiss girls, you and Daniela mm-hmm. in 08. So you were mentioned in her Olympic Games and, <laughs> and here, Laura, you were a part of this one too, right? So you, you guys were really close, fourth and sixth, right? You were, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. exactly. For me, it was a big change between 204 and 208 because until 205, I was uh, coached by my father. He coached me for basically 15 years and I think he did an amazing job. Like, it's not easy at all to coach a, a young athlete through puberty, to make, make her an Olympian and to coach her so that she still loves the sports. So he did mm. really, really well. Um, I was extremely happy with him. But there was after the Olympics, there was a point where I knew that if I wanted to to be even better and to not just participate, but to to have a chance to win a medal or to to do to have a top ten uh, result, I needed to change something. And he was he was too kind to push me, which was perfect because our father daughter relationship was much more important and I still train with him and I still enjoy spending time with him and I think that's the reason why because he was also always like really kind but pushing myself the whole time was not getting me where I wanted to to go so there was a time in 206 where I changed um, coaches and went to Brett that's yeah that, that was a huge change for me um to uh, go to an international squad, go to a, to a completely different Australian coach and to await. I was uh, much more competitive, I think. I wasn't, I wasn't world class yet. I did have an outside chance to, to win a medal in, in case that, yes, that we could have broken away on the bike or something special would have happened. But I was, I was very happy with my sixth place. I think that was my level there and I did, did a great race. I think you should have been. Laura, did you feel like Nicola was coming? <laughs> <laughs> and do you often just remind her that you beat her at that Olympics? Yes. <laughs> With a stellar career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was an interesting one. I think because of all of the front pack swimmers from 04 all retired. Yeah. And so it was kind of the girls from the second pack were now starting to come from behind and so yeah, that was always a always a threat from anybody who was up at the front a little bit more out, out of the swim. Well, there was yeah. ten seconds in it between you guys. I just looked up the results, so you can hang that over <laughs> Nicola for the rest of the show, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> well, until we get to twenty twelve. Yes, exactly. That's what I wanted to say. What was the gap twenty twelve? Tables turn, don't they, Nicola? 
<laughs> so slow down, Laura. She I just, I just know I had to chase Laura the whole bike uh, bike oh. course in London. Yeah, yeah, I have photos of that. I was like, what are you doing back there? Get off my wheel. Get to the front. <laughs> we were in the same path. Yeah, that was me. I was coming out of the water there. I was like, where, where is everyone? <laughs> I know. Yeah, that was that was crazy. So London, did we oh, skip yeah. over London? Is it really important? No, oh, not that much. Let's, <laughs> um, let, um, let's do it. I, I love this London so Olympics. Good. So um, good. Yeah, London nervous? Olympics. I mean, um, you did that, you did well, that she half. was two years as a professional. So she yes, just- exactly. <laughs> yes. So yeah. <laughs> I I had two years as a professional. Um, yes, London was my my big big goal. Um, I knew I knew we wanted to start a family afterwards, so I was I was very excited about that race because I preparation went almost perfect. I remember writing a letter to my team, to my teammates and, and my coach before the Olympics, just saying thank you for for this amazing time, for the training, for the preparation. I just said, Well, it was so nice. I've learned so much, and no matter how the Olympics turn out, it was it was worth it, and I, I really enjoyed it. So, for me, that time, even not knowing how the Olympics would turn out, was a, an amazing time. I, I will always remember as one of the of the nicest times of of my life. And I think if you can say that for uh, from a hard Olympic preparation, it's it's pretty cool. So yes. Almost everything went perfect. I, I had a great squad. I had uh, guys I could train with the whole the whole time. Um, we had really nice training camps, and yeah, I just I just enjoyed the preparation. It was just all going well. And, and the race itself. I mean, for people that haven't seen it, go YouTube the 2012 <laughs> Olympic Games women's triathlon and the sprint finish. It really is one of the all time great images we have in the sport of triathlon. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it, it, is. Was really, it was really special. You and Lisa Norton, um, Aaron Denshin was with you mm. and uh, Sarah True not far behind. But when you, you guys came onto that blue carpet, was it deafening sound? What, what was that that moment especially? What was that like running yeah. on the blue carpet? Well, I think, of course, if you win the Olympics, it's always probably always the, the most special Olympics, but the atmosphere in, in London was just amazing. Like there were so many people, so many spectators. It was so loud. You couldn't hear when you shifted the gear. You couldn't hear anything. There was one corner um, on the run uh, the people weren't allowed to stand and you had a, a ringing in, in your ears like you would have come out of the disco. Like it was everywhere else, it was so loud. And of course, that was that was amazing. It pushed you to go faster. Um, I can't remember any other race um, being even close as in an amazing atmosphere. And it was, it was like this the whole Olympics, like the day before I was riding somewhere with my bike and I was uh, riding on the pathway like where normal normally only the people are only allowed to walk and two policemen came towards me and stopped me and said you're not allowed to walk uh, to ride here and there's a fine and I was like well but I'm I'm competing in the, the Olympics and they said okay just go on you can ride wherever you want <laughs> so <laughs> I was like Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, so you just have the feeling that everyone was behind those Olympics and was enjoying it. I was really proud that the Olympics were in London. So the race itself, um, I swam. I swam fine. I came out of the water and saw all my main competitors, except Laura, of course. She was about one and a half minutes <laughs> in front. But on I own. Own. Yes, on <laughs> own. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm going to do this on my own. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> but but like like Helen Jenkins, Lisa yeah. Norden, I, I saw all the names I, I had on my list. Basically, um, we were catching up the the few in the front, Laura, um, quite fast. Like I, I we, we made up time pretty fast, so I wasn't too worried. And um, we were big pack on the bike. So my plan was to just get off the bike with the front pack, run the same pace as the first ones, and then sprint, out sprint everyone in the end. 
um, pretty simple. And uh, But I had some signs of cramps already on the bike and then on the run it got worse like uh, after every turnaround I felt those little cramps after every change of pace I felt signs of cramps so I was pretty worried I would have a, a real cramp in the end and I changed tactics I didn't do the 200 meter fast sprint we, we were um, training for in in a lot of training sessions but I was uh, deciding to to build up the pace over a longer distance. And then in the end, I saw, I, I saw uh, someone holding up a sign that Helen had dropped. So I knew she was gone, but we were still four people, four athletes left. So I was just um, increasing the pace slowly and increasing it more. And finally, we got to the long blue carpet and I started to sprint. As I said, the atmosphere was amazing and a lot of people were asking me afterwards if I knew that Lisa Norden got closer and closer again in the last few meters. And yes, I exactly knew exactly because there was a a big screen for for the VIP people on the on the how do you say on the standing standing day and the screen showed the the race live. So I actually watched the screen and saw myself and Lisa coming closer again while we were sprinting. And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> and I just, <laughs> so, yes, I, I knew she was getting closer. I knew it would get really, really close uh, to the finish line. And I just thought of all the trainings we have done of everything I put into this preparation, I thought of that might be the the one and only chance I have to, to become Olympic champion. And I just, I knew I just had to reach that finish line first, no matter how. And I think in the end, I ran more with my head than with my legs because they were completely empty. But um, yeah, I somehow, somehow made it to that finish line. And in, in the first moment, I was just happy. It was all over. And we were lying there and there was just, I think everyone was exhausted. <laughs> and, and then you, you didn't know for oh, quite yeah. some time who had exactly. actually won though. That's how close it was, right? Yes. But you, you had an inclination, right? You, you did yeah. have an inclination. It was extremely close. And yes, as an athlete, I think you always have a, a feeling, like if you won or not. And of course, you don't rely on your feeling. Um, at Olympic Games, it's way too important. So I was asking Lisa... Um, what she thought and to my relief she said well I think you won but I I'm happy about second place and I thought well yes I might also be happy about second place but it's such a huge difference if you are Olympic champion or if you're second I just need to know first definitely what it is and then I can be happy about whatever it is and um, yes we needed to wait about I don't know about eight minutes or certainly like more than just two or three minutes until they had uh, looked at the finishing picture and, and everything and came out with the decision. And it seemed a long time to us as we were, while we were preparing for the award ceremony. Unreal. It felt like forever. It probably felt like forever. <laughs> I think we got, did we all have breakfast the next morning? You, yes, we did. Was it the <laughs> yes. next morning we had breakfast with you and Rita, right? Yeah, yeah, was yeah going, exactly. What? We're sitting with an Olympic champion. I think all of us were like, yeah. what? What just happened? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, it's just what, well. What if you it, become it, Olympic it, champion, it's yeah, it's it's really crazy because it happens. Everything happens so fast. Like as I said, like only a few minutes later, there was the award ceremony. Then you, of course, have a lot of interviews. Then you have the press conference. Then you have the doping control and. Like after two or three hours, you are allowed to have a shower. Like you're still in your clothes from the race, you know. Mm. And and then it gets to the Swiss house, and there's more interviews and TV and and fans and dinner with with your friends and and family, and that's all amazing. But you have not a single moment to yourself or to to think about what just happened. And I think that's why so many athletes say, "Well, I." It took me a long time to realize what, what happened and that I became Olympic champion or world champion because it's there's so many things happening afterwards and you don't have any time for yourself and to sit down and have a moment. 
It's amazing, isn't it? Because I, I look back and I think, well, we had that breakfast the morning after, which we thought was really special. Yeah. But then it's been nine years <laughs> so that true. you've been so busy since winning that Olympic gold that here we are finally having a chat. So <laughs> that's the impact. Yeah. So, that's pretty busy. so Flora Duffy, who just won, we'll, we'll talk to you in uh, 2030. Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. I mean, the life does get pretty hectic. I mean, it is yeah. wonderful. Congrats on that again. Amazing. And then oh. I, loved the, I loved the race in Rio too. I thought that was really fun. I enjoyed, again, for people that haven't listened to it, when I have all the, the female Olympic champions from 2008 on, Gwen Jorgensen shares her thoughts on that race and you were chiming in sharing your thoughts on this race in 2016 when you were slowing down and talking to each other and everything else. Um, give us a little bit of a recap on that. I know you shared the story two weeks ago, but if you can give us a, a recap for people that haven't listened to that episode of what was going on, 2016, you and Gwen have broken away from the field and are on the run. You happen to be doing all the leading and going, hang on, what's going on here? Tell us, take us through that a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, well, what I I guess what I like about those five Olympics I've been is that each one has been completely different and each preparation has been completely different. So, as I said, for for London, I was a professional athlete for two years and could really like focus on on sports and on myself and uh, being self centered. And then for Rio, everything was different. Like I was a, a mom. Um, had a family. I was the Olympic champion, so I was the one uh, being chased. And I, as as we mentioned before, I I had my hand broken a, a few months before, so it was a completely different um, preparation. We had to change everything, and that was that was the interesting part about it. Like, how can I be on the top again with completely different circumstances? And I am pretty proud of the of the Olympics in Rio to win a medal again, to win silver this time. But for me, it was probably, in in a way, it was almost more special than gold in London because I had my family there. I had my, I had Rita there, my husband, and I had Yanis there, our little son, and to share it with those two was was really amazing. Was really emotional. Yeah, how the race went. I, I I had a good swim. Basically, all the favorites came out of the swim together. I tried to get away on the bike. I couldn't. I couldn't break away, but I think I could. It. I could make it quite hard and um, tire some people, some fast runners out. And then I knew Gwen would be really fast on the run and really hard to to follow. But I. I was I was determined to just hang on to her as long as I could. Um, I suffered a lot in the first half of the run, but the positive was I was uh, there was a gap between us two and the the next two or three athletes. So at least I saw that as a positive and thought, well, it's really hard. I might not be able to hang on um, the whole run course, but I I can get a gap between the other athletes and myself. Um, but then surprisingly for me, Gwen let me lead after the first half and I was quite surprised because she never did that in, in other races. So I thought, well, maybe she's not a hundred percent convinced she can win or she tries something new or that's, that's not bad. It's not bad for sure because I could run my own pace and I could slow down a bit. <laughs> get a breath <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so yeah. there was a like positive and like sweet <laughs> <I could take. laughs> yes exactly so i was like oh, okay <laughs> that's better <laughs> but um we, we we went into the headwind again and i knew if i would lead in a headwind i would have no chance to to answer um an attack of her afterwards in the tailwind so I told her to lead again and she she wasn't willing to. She said, no, I, I was leading the first half. That was the point where I tried to just get her out of her rhythm and get her in a little conversation and try to just um, do something different to, to shake her up a little bit. And I, I just said, well, yes, but I, I already have a gold medal and you don't. So um, you have to lead <laughs> Say that? Yes. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so, Look what I have. Nah. <laughs> you 
you want lunch? Yeah. You're going to earn it. You're going to earn it today. That, that is great. But I, I, I was a bit scared because I knew we had like 25 seconds. And I thought, well, like I can probably – I can play for 10 seconds, but then we really have to go again. Otherwise, the other ones are coming from behind. Mm. So we didn't have much time. And um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but it, it was quite funny because we normally, in, in triathlon, you never see that. We never do that. Mm. And it was something I discussed with Brett before because he said, well, Gwen, Gwen is the faster runner than you. So if you can't drop her on the bike, you just need to try to get her out of her rhythm to try to to do something to yeah to to disturb her because she she's just running faster than you and that's what i tried and i think in the end i um i only won the silver and she she was better but i'm proud because i did everything i could like physically mentally i just tried all the tactics i had and and that's i think that's that's what it is about just to try your best to to give your best and then be happy with the result i I think that's my favorite line on all the podcasts i've done well i have a gold medal so what do you want one you want one (laughs) well she has one now too so i know yes but she doesn't have a silver as well so I know. That's just. I love that's, that. That's uh, what I will say at the next Olympics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I like to hear that. No, 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 no. You might as well hang on for Paris. No, huh? not really. <laughs> it's, like a week, it's a week away. It's like a week away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're picking teams, I think, next week, aren't they, Laura? Yeah, didn't you hear? You're going to be focusing until you're. You go sub eight. Well, that's it. You'll go sub eight in six months. You'll have the Olympics all this space. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll talk some more off, off air, but we'll make this happen, everybody. Don't yeah. worry about it. Nicholas Griggs, sixth <laughs> mm, Olympics. Probably, probably. not. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of all these Olympics, and we've run through them all, is there a career highlight beyond the Olympics that we haven't covered that you kind of look back and go, that was really special? I mean, you've won – you've won a lot of different events and you've had some spectacular success. Is there anything beyond Olympic gold, Olympic silver and all your Olympic experiences that stands out to you in your career? Um, Yeah, I think in a career there are always races which don't stand out to other people, like probably from the placing they're not that good. Like let's let's say in the lead up to Beijing, to the Olympics in Beijing, 208, I was was injured, I had a knee injury. And all I could do um, before the qualifying race was running uphill. That was all like downhill wouldn't work and, and flat wouldn't work. I could just run uphill. So Brett, of course, as, as he is, he said, well, no problem. We are in the Philippines and you just take a taxi, you run uphill and then the taxi will drive you down. And uh, <laughs> so I, I was running uphill, <laughs> taxi would drive me down, I was running uphill again. And that was my preparation for the qualifying race in Ishigaki. I think I got 60 and I was so happy and just proud because I had a lot of pressure to do those, uh, do that qualification. I, I wasn't prepared well, obviously, and I performed really well, even if for outside people. Like, obviously, if you see that sixth place, it's nothing special. Um, and I think a lot of such races where I was just really happy with my performance and how I handled the situation and handled the pressure, yes, are, are also worth a lot and a great experience, even if you can't really see it with a medal hanging around your neck. What was always special for me was, uh, was the European Championships. I can't really say why, but I love I love the Europeans. And obviously, yes, I won it six times. And there were also European Games I won. Um, mm-hmm. And they were, I was, I, I think I'm always proud to race for Switzerland as well, for my country. So, if it's Olympics or European Championships or World Championships, I, I love those races and um, yeah, that those are those are really good memories to to think back on. Isn't it interesting when you you look at your resume and and Laura, you probably have the same. I have the same. Where you, where you kind of go, I remember what I had to go through to get that second, that third, that sixth, like you mentioned, and nobody ever knows what you went mm-hmm. through to get yep. to that start line. And you go, and I actually pulled something together. <laughs> 
and yeah. nobody else cares. Yeah. <laughs> <You're> yes. like, <laughs> but it means something to me. Uh, yeah. You don't get the mic unless you won, right? You yeah. don't get the mic unless yeah. you won. Nobody's going to listen to you. Yeah. I know. But that's great. I, I, I yeah. appreciate you sharing that because I think it is important that we recognize it. Yes, yeah. the winning is very special, but it's also the journey and the process and overcoming obstacles. Definitely, just to get to definitely. Line. Or like after after my third child, when I still thought the Olympics were took would took place in two twenty, like mm-hmm. <laughs> before COVID times, yeah. um, I I had my uh, Alexis, I was third child in two nineteen in April, and I had to qualify for the Olympics, and I knew it would be so close, like just no time to qualify. And I was doing the World Championship Series race in in Hamburg um, about twelve weeks after after giving birth, and it was so early. And I was actually just doing it to help the team qualify because there was the mixed team relay uh, worlds there. It gave a lot of points for the team qualifying for the Olympics, and I thought, well, I might as well start at the at the single uh, individual race as well. In the end, I got eighth there and I was so happy and so relieved because it was such a surreal experience. Like I was, all I was caring about was that the baby wasn't hungry when I was racing and I, that I could feed him before and after. And it was, it was kind of funny because I had such like such different problems to all the other athletes there. <laughs> it was it was a really it was it was a fun experience and i will always remember yeah as you say those special moments where no one else can really see what you're going through but for yourself it's it's really good memories and and uh you will always remember those times yeah what you're capable of yeah the balance the resilience and the adaptability is incredible Uh, it really is i'm i'm so impressed with all of you (laughs) All of the moms out there and, and, and then to, to do what you're doing is just incredible. Okay, what I want to do now is I'm going to step into a bit of fun, not that we haven't had much fun for the yeah. last hour, but <laughs> 10 ra- fun rapid-fire questions. You up for that? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fast twitch fibers, here we go. All right, Laura, you and I Well, there's an the extra few seconds because I'm old, right? I'm not that fast exactly. anymore. Exactly, yeah, we'll, okay. we'll delay that because you're now training for Ironman. Yes, or exactly. <laughs> long distance now. <laughs> yeah, long distance. Okay, I'll, I'll lead. Laura, you can then follow with the next one. Okay. What is your favorite va- family vacation? Um, She's in Ironman. How much, how much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> she is not doing Olympic training anymore, family, people. Fam- <laughs> Family vacations are great anyway. Like we, had, we just have been at the ocean. That's amazing. and uh, all, But also skiing with the family is really cool. So I like both. Okay, perfect. You can do both. Yeah. Laura, up. Okay. What are you currently watching on Netflix or streaming? Uh, I have been watching a, a, a kid series with my oldest son because he was sleeping uh, with me in the room <laughs> before, the, before the race in Mallorca. So oh. he was up early with me and he said, what, what are we doing now? And I was like, well, watching movies. I was like, yes. <laughs> so I don't even know. I think it was the, the Dragon Prince or something, a kid uh, series. Go, good okay. on you. Those kids' movies are All right. Different. First car you owned? That was a VW Golf and I wasn't even – allowed to drive yet i had to still learn i <laughs> he was my sponsor and i had, <laughs> still had to learn how to drive and <laughs> obviously i didn't own the car and honestly i never owned a car in my life yet i was always sponsored my whole life since 18 so nice. i have wow. yet to buy a car in my life <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. You're going to have to keep that going. Do you hear I that? Like a lot to say that? Who are you with now? Who's your car sponsor now? Uh, Land Rover. Oh, okay. So you're just doing rubbish cars now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Laura, you're up. <laughs> what are your two most used apps on your phone? Um, WhatsApp and Instagram, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you could swap jobs with anyone else in the world, what would it be? I don't want to swap jobs, otherwise I would do it. I think I have a great job. 
No, yeah. Okay. Well, I wasn't prepared for that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to swap jobs, you should do it. You should learn another job. Yeah, I like just, that. All right, just get it done, Greg. Yeah, fair enough. That's, uh, that's what we're talking about here today. Seriously, <laughs> just I feel like I'm done. incredibly lazy with Nicola on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> just do it, Greg. Stop talking about it. All right, which would you rather do: wash dishes, mow the lawn, clean the bathroom, or vacuum the house? Well, I think wash dishes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, no, I do. I'm the same. Really? Yeah. I don't know. Every, every guy <laughs> on the show says mow the lawn, which I totally embrace. <laughs> well, um, if you have a, a, a mowing machine you can sit on, yes, definitely. Yeah. True. Well, you know That's what Ben great. Knut said? He said mow the lawn and then he told me, oh, yeah, but, you know, we have fake grass, so I wouldn't have to do anything then. <laughs> I thought he. I thought he has one of those roboters, you know, mowing by itself. Yeah, so, well, he yeah. might as well. Oh, yeah, he doesn't even have to. All right, this this question's probably redundant, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. First job. Yeah, that's true. I never had a job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Sounds familiar, Laura. <laughs> I don't think we're in the job either. Come on. Well, you were a professional through. athlete for two years, Nicola. So. Yeah, that's true. Professional athlete, first job. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Which decade of music is the best? I, I'm going to say uh, skip that question because I'm not talking about music. No one knows what's on my iPod, and um, that's going to stay like it. Oh, music is a personal not. theme. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about our kids, but we're not talking about what's on our iPhone. Exactly. Or what do you call iPhone? That's wow. private. That's Secret. Good. All right. I like that. That's a fair enough answer. All right. Where is somewhere you haven't been in the world that you'd like to go? Oh, lots of places. I haven't been much to South America. Mm-hmm. I haven't been to uh, to the north of Europe, like Finland and and uh, Sweden, much. So, and Africa, I haven't been to many places. So there's lo- I love to I love to travel. So there's lots of places I would still I like to see. Mm. Yeah, but it's not, you haven't really been anywhere, have you? Uh, true. It's always. It's I mean, with sport, location. it's amazing, isn't it? You just go wherever the World Series is, and <laughs> you turn up. People go, "Oh, you've traveled the world," and go, "Well, I've seen the Ishigaki Hotel." Yeah, the, exactly. You know. <laughs> at the mm. pool. Ten times, yes. yes. Ten times. And the pool, yes. <laughs> all right. All right. Greatest movie of all time. Um, I like I like Forrest Gump, and I like uh, Braveheart. Good choices. Nice. I like both of those. Well done. Mm. Yeah, I'd I'd agree with those. Well, that was it. That was a rapid fire. You did pretty well. Yeah. You probably Thank answered you. it more like at a, a half Iron Man type pace. Oh, so, I got fast in the end. You did get faster, <laughs> or you declined to answer, which sped it up. As well. <laughs> well. Uh, can, can we, before I let you go, can we give do a little bit of a run through on? I want to know how you kind of operate on a daily basis um, because managing the three kids. Um, I, I, I guess on that, are, are the kids managing themselves? Because I know Rito wouldn't be bringing them up. So how is it going? <laughs> are, are they the, raising themselves? Are they or? raising themselves? <laughs> How in the world are you guys operating That's on a daily so basis? Amazing. Take us through a typical day in the life of Nicholas Spirig. Uh, how, I mean, I guess it's probably not a typical day so much, but a training day. How does it operate um, between yourself and Rito and managing the kids? Um, yes, exactly. I don't think there's a typical day. Like every day looks a bit different. But um, it's... Um, it's a mix. It's basically I don't have a s- fixed training plan, but we see what the kids are up to if they're having school, like uh, in in normal school times. Um, now the two older ones are in school and kindergarten. The youngest one is still at home, and then I tell my coach what I'm up to with the kids, what I have to be, where I have to be, when I have to be for the kids, and when I can train then he has to find the best um, program, training program to, to get the most out of the day. So that's basically what happens. Um, I, I always try to either um, have breakfast with them or lunch. I definitely always have dinner with uh, the family. And Reed also, he adapts to, to my day, to the kids' day. And so 
we we see it as a privilege to have that life where I I basically work, but I still see the kids after every training session, and he has a lot of time with the kids. So, to as as parents, we have a lot of time with the kids, and probably also as a whole family, not whole days, but a lot of of uh, time mm. during the day. So we see that as a as a big privilege to spend so much time with the kids, and also. I can sometimes I tell my coach, well, today I need the afternoon off because we want to go to the zoo or we want to do something else. And luckily he accepts that. And it also, there's also the other um, scenario where he says, well, that session is pretty important or that day is pretty important. Then I adapt to the training and um, read or, um, organizes the whole family. So it depends a bit on the day. It's amazing how you guys, I mean, it is quite the team, yourself, Rito, Brett, who else is a part of that team? Have you got managers yes. or people helping you with the social media and all of that kind of, I mean, the, yeah. there's a lot, there's a lot more that goes on too. Definitely. There's, there's a huge team because obviously professional triathlon doesn't just exist out of training. It's also, as you say, social media, it's events, it's uh, sponsors, it's, um, interviews so that needs to fit in somehow as well it's not easy it's especially i think the recovery with three kids is very difficult to manage non-existent <laughs> non-existent exactly that's that's the right word no but and it, it does need a huge team like if i wouldn't have first of all rito who helps a lot who understands as a uh, professional athlete uh, himself in, in former years, what it takes to be at the top, who is willing to, to support me in every way. I, I would have no chance to, to do what I do. But yes, there are a lot of people like my manager, um, Brad, who adapts everything, the whole training, um, both parents, he's a mine, um, sponsors, bike mechanic, like a lot of people who just help and support and without them it wouldn't be possible. It's really quite incredible. Your sponsors that you have now, how many of them have sort of been with you throughout your career? Have you had a lot of long-term sponsors? Yes, yes, I had a lot of, it's just one of them. Well, the longest one is actually my, my bike mechanic. I think he sponsored me when I was 15 or something. So it's oh, wow. amazing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he is really like well a good friend of course now as well i he's he's his twins are my godsons and and everything but um i had i had a few really long um sponsorships like now um a gas company is is sponsoring me since 15 years another bank is sponsoring me since 10 years so uh, a lot of long-term co- uh, sponsorships and also what I really appreciate, like ob- obviously through three pregnancies and coming back and injuries and that has been quite amazing. Yes, I was always uh, really lucky. It, wow. It's amazing, Switzerland. I was just thinking about that, you know, with some of your sponsors, with Cancellara, Federa, yourself, Daniela Riff. Is it, you, there's some real rock stars that come out of, come out of Switzerland. Yeah. It really is incredible. You guys, do you find yourself at many of the same events, all sort of the best in Switzerland? Do you often, I mean, not hang out, but you're kind of doing many of the same kind of things? Um, yeah, some some athletes you meet more and others less, but definitely it's always a highlight to to meet the other athletes. Um, if it's a sports awards or other events, and we also. I'm, I'm, for example, in a, in a team which has a lot of different athletes from different sports. And that's so interesting. I think for all the athletes, just to have this ex- exchange with other athletes. And this way, I was also like taking part in a, in a bobsleigh world cup once with one of those athletes. I read that picture. <laughs> I saw that. You guys came 16th or something. Yeah. I did yeah see that. It, it, it's so, it was so interesting. And, um, I can, you know, in the team, there's also like bike riders like Stefan Kung. And I was asking him before the Olympics, like, what pressure do you uh, put into the tires when it's raining? And they, they really like, he was at the Tour de France and I was like, Oh my God, I'm, disturbing his race but he was answering immediately and really like oh and this teammate is like 
65 kilos so he's probably more like you and he puts that much pressure in and i <laughs> so was like oh, okay that's great. thank that's you great. go back to your race now <laughs> <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> but now that's that's really i find that really cool like to meet the other athletes from other sports and to learn from them and to just have this exchange that's awesome i've had a i've become friends with uh, Nino Schurter yeah. who came on the show last year, yeah, yeah. Um, another great Swiss athlete. It really is quite incredible, the amount of incredible athletes coming out of um, Switzerland. It, it, it's amazing. Yeah, so I think we're, we're a small people. country and we probably don't have that support system uh, which other countries have and we, we need to build our own teams and our own support system. But if we manage to do that, it's – it's quite well. I think that's why we might not have hundreds of athletes, but if we do have athletes, they are quite good and they come to the top. It, it's very much like I think Switzerland should take on New Zealand. Yes, the, probably. I, I kind of look at the two <laughs> exactly. countries, fairly similar, yeah. you know, smaller populations but seem to be able to Amazing produce athletes. constant great athletes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One final area I want to chat to you before we, we kind of go on um, is mental strategies. How have you been able to sort of manage that nervous energy? Because we've known you a long time and you always tended to have be fairly nervous before events. <laughs> <laughs> is it doing a half, half Ironman in the morning of a race? What is nice that, I mean? that, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you gotten better at managing that? As, because you were. You, you Yes, I was extremely nervous. nervous. When I was young, I was crazy nervous, like, Mm-hmm. As a junior, I think I was one week before the race, I was al- already getting nervous. And um, of course, losing a lot of energy like that, like it's not, uh, I think uh, being a bit nervous is really good. I, I need to be nervous to have um, that adrenaline and um, to, to really show my best performance. But yeah, it was it was definitely over the top. I was way too nervous. I had to I had to change, and I think Brett helped me there quite a lot to just calm me down in the way that he said, "Well, you you can just do your best. If you do your best, you should be happy, and I will be happy, and ever everyone around you will be or, or has to be happy. They can't expect more of you than you do your best." and that is really simple, but it helped me and, and it still helps me. If I'm getting too nervous, sitting down at the quiet place and just calm down and say, well, all you need to do is do your best and that's it. No one, no one should expect more of yourself. And, and that's something I can, I can do in my mind, yeah. you know, um, that's what I always do in training. And so this simple, sentence has helped me a lot to manage the nervousness and to to calm down in the in the situation where i'm getting too nervous and i i feel i can feel that it's not healthy or not beneficial anymore it's like a i think quite often when you you, you're aiming for perfection and that creates that anxiety because you want perfection yeah. You know, Laura, we talk about it a bit, don't we, with exactly. with parenting. It's like there's oh, no such thing as being it. a perfect yeah. mum. <laughs> well, I have to keep reminding forget Laura it. of that. No way. <laughs> <laughs> Just never, do your best, Laura. I've never been so committed to something and feel like you fail every day. <laughs> 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 it's like it's like the, whole, the ultimate responsibility of just yeah. wanting to, you know, perform. Yeah. I know what well, you mean. I, <laughs> I, I like that though. We'll, we'll all leave with that. Just do your best. Actually, I, I yeah. do want to ask you: Can we finish with two questions before I let you go? I know we've kept you a long time, but it has been fun and really appreciate it. Um, so, can I? I'll ask you two questions. What is one tip you have for people on how to optimize their life? I really think you should always follow your dreams and 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 try to achieve your goals and even if they're big and even if they seem to even if you seem to not being able to achieve it and even if you do not achieve it at some sometimes um I think the way there is always worth it I, like you mm-hmm. you get so many many experiences uh you, you learn so much on the way there that in the end, it sometimes doesn't even matter if you reach your goal or not. The way there was, to me, always whatever I 
really wanted and really put my passion and energy in, it was worth like following my dreams and my goals. I, I like that. It's like you set the goal so you can have the journey. And, and it is all, it's all about the journey, isn't it? But you can't have the journey if you don't know where you're going. Yeah. So yes. put something out there and go yeah. towards it. Yeah, it right. needs to be something you really want to and, and have the passion for it and want to uh-huh. want to achieve but sometimes well you can't you can't um, control all the circumstances and everything so sometimes it doesn't happen yes i i do think to me it was always worth going the going the way they even no matter if i reached the goal in the end or not i love that yeah very good okay if you could sit and have a coffee with any living person who would it be and why Ah, my husband. <laughs> we, we, were so, <laughs> we were so busy. I haven't seen him, haven't seen him today. It's that damn, damn Olympic gold medal. <laughs> that is fantastic. I, I see him so a lot. Crazy. I see him a lot. But normally we always no, have our kids him. around or something to discuss so whatever. So yeah. to sit down with him and just have a quiet coffee and some nice time, yeah, at the moment that would be – the person I would sit down with. <laughs> we uh, can totally relate to that. That, that is that such is a so great answer. I think every parent listening is going nodding, going, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Best answer I've heard. I sit next to this person, around me all the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I see him all the time, but I don't really sit down with him and have coffee. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so great. All right, Nicola, this has been fantastic. What's next for you? Um, you wrapped up the year. Have you got any more racing? Or yeah, no, I think that was uh, the last race. I'm happy with the season and um, just having some time at home. Um, if we if we stay quite busy with some events and and stuff, and then concentrate on the training for for sub eight next year. Fantastic. Well, I'm so glad we made this happen. Laura, Laura, <laughs> Laura was so excited. Uh, Laura, you haven't been on the, episode, on the show for quite a few months, so this was yeah, nice to really come back. Nicola, thank you again for your time, just sharing all your journey and just, just your experiences and your knowledge. It's absolutely fantastic. So, so thank you again. Yeah, Thanks. thank you too. It was nice to, to talk to you after nine years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right thank you everyone for listening you can see all the show notes timestamps links and coupon codes at bennettendurance.com forward slash media all right thanks again nicola stay on the line thanks a lot for listening if you enjoyed the show your support would truly be appreciated you can visit the patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice don't miss the next episode so subscribe and be notified For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.